It is great to be back here. My wife and I were just talking about this last night as we drove up here. Thank you so much also for the wonderful hospitality, putting us up in a hotel last night so we can be rested this morning. But we were talking about, it's been almost 13 years since we started our journey toward the mission field, and we started right here at Marysville Berean Church. You were our very first stop, and the first ones to join us on the journey uh, in, in the world of missions and advancing the gospel in different parts of the world, and we're so excited for that. And I'm really looking forward to the next hour where we'll be able to give you a little bit of an update on the ministry God has given us and to bring you into that a little bit more in detail. But my wonderful, beautiful wife, Mindy, is sitting here on the front row. Uh, we didn't bring our seven children, as you noticed. Um, they're back in Kansas City serving in church this morning. They're doing very well, and they send their greetings. It's really good to be here, just really good to see your faces and to open the Word of God. Can we just open in prayer, and then we'll dig in. Father, I thank you uh, for this gift, the gift of worshiping uh, our God and doing so knowing with confidence that you have, as we've just sung, you have given us the very righteousness of the Son of God, the spotless Lamb, and we are forever united in Him. And that is our confidence, that is our hope, and it is our joy this morning that we could come and proclaim those truths to you and to exalt you. And now, Lord, as we open your word, I pray, God, that you would be our teacher and that you would guide this next few moments. Help us to listen well, help us to respond with the obedience of faith, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we're nine days, I think nine, away from an, a pretty momentous occasion in our country, an election. Uh, we have had so much going on in our culture recently, right, uh, that have, that really, for me as a Christian, as a Christ follower, it has burdened me. There's so much going on in our society. There are weighty issues that are being tossed back and forth in our country, and we're all feeling it. Uh, you guys surely feel the tension like I do. I don't think there's ever been a time in my life where the tensions have been higher in our nation. People are anxious. People are, they're afraid. They feel threatened. Uh, they're concerned they might be canceled, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're concerned that they might say the wrong thing or even think the wrong thing and then suffer the consequences. Maybe get fired from their job or be, be forced out of a position or, or be cut off from a relationship. Relationships are being broken. Uh, cities are being burned today. Lives are being taken. And everything just has become so divisive, so political, and none of us can escape it, can we? This is the, this is the moment in history that we're living in right now. And we're seeing worldviews just clash head on in our nation. And, and instead of dialoguing, instead of listening, instead of reasoning together, instead of seeing individual persons before us and, and seeking to understand them and to grasp and listen, to understand where they're coming from, the mood has become dismissive, hasn't it? It's argumentative, and sometimes it becomes downright violent. And I'm concerned, I'm deeply concerned about our country. But I'm even more concerned about this man's heart. I'm concerned about the heart of God's people. Because to be honest, there have been moments in these last months where I have been tempted to play by the world's rules in some sense, uh, to play on their battlefield by accepting the premise that these issues that we're all hearing about every single day, that these issues are the issues, and they're not the issue, is it? Are they? They're not. But when I get swept into that narrative and my my blood begins to boil, you know what I mean? I, too, want to get out my eraser, and I want to cancel a few people out. Have you ever felt that way? You ever felt yourself thinking on occasion, man, those people, or, or that group, or more, that political leader, oh, oh, oh. get my eraser out. God, wouldn't it be better if you just sort of, you know, took them off the scene? Have you ever felt that way? I don't think I've ever gone so far, I hope, to actually wish horrible ill on a person or a group of people. But boy, I felt that inside, haven't you? That, that when I start to focus on a certain movement or something that's really important to me, some issue of the day, I stop seeing people. I stop seeing people who are created in the image of God, people who are fallen like I am, 
but who could potentially become worshipers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And instead, I see obstacles, I see barriers that are in my way. And that burdens me, that saddens me as a follower of Jesus Christ, that I or that any one of us here or any of God's people across our nation could become so nearsighted, so, so blinded that we for, have forgotten that we too needed to be cleansed from our former sins. Do you feel what I'm feeling? So I'm burdened because we need mercy. We need mercy. And I will share that what has encouraged me in all of this is that by God's grace, he has revealed this heart problem to me. He's allowed it to surface. That, that's grace. That's the grace of God. Grace never, never ignores sin. Grace always brings it to the surface so that it can be resolved and dealt with head on in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's grace. And I, I want my life not to be about some movement or some political cause. I want my life to be about the mission, his mission. And I'm sure that you want that too, don't you? That's why we're here this morning, worshiping our Lord. So this morning, we're going to take a look at a passage of Scripture that the Lord brought to my mind uh, recently over the last few months, and, and largely it attracted me because I saw myself right in the middle of it. It's in the text in Luke chapter 9, where Jesus is going through Samaria. You recall Jesus uh, is traveling from Galilee southerly toward Jerusalem, and he's passing through Samaria, and he sends some of his disciples ahead of him to look for accommodations in, in a Samaritan village. And, and uh, Jesus uh, and his disciples, uh, as they're going through Samaria, they, the Samaritans discover that Jesus has no plans really to stop and stay there. And so the Samaritans uh, have no intention to house him, and they just flat out say, no, we don't want you here. And you probably recall that there's a longstanding division and prejudice that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans, don't you? Um, it, it, this bad blood stemmed long ago. It, was, it started with this ethnic problem when the people, when the Israelites were taken into captivity by the king of Assyria. The area of Samaria used to belong to the tribe of Ephraim and the half-tribe of Manasseh. When the ten tribes were taken into captivity by the Assyrian king, most of the nobles and the higher-ups of Israel were taken away, but then some were left. And what they did is the Assyrians would then force intermarriage among the, the population that remained. And so to the Jews, those who remained and were intermarried with the Assyrians, they became a contaminated people. They were a population of half-breeds. And part of the animosity that existed between the Jews and the Samarians, Samaritans excuse me, stemmed from the way that they had also contaminated the Jewish religion. You know, the Samaritans, they believed uh, in the first five books of Moses, but then they rejected the prophets and they rejected the Jewish traditions. They also rejected the temple. And they erected their own temple. They, they had their own priesthood. They had an idolatrous system that had been set up. And their beliefs and their worldviews and even their physical traits because of their intermarriage set them apart in the nation of Israel as the undesirables around Israel. So when I get to Luke chapter 9, where do I see myself right in that account? Well, Luke tells us that after this Samaritan village rejected Jesus, James and John come to the Lord, and they say to him, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? That's pretty harsh, right? Let's just burn them all. I'm certain that in some way the disciples felt sure that they were justified. I mean, after all, sometimes we need to take a stand. We need to stand up for what's right. We need to stand up for Jesus. You know, we can't just let people get away with some of the things that they say or some of the things that they do. And that's really where it hit close to home for me. I don't know about for you. So that is what originally drew me to this passage. Something in me knew that Ken Heiser needed to renew his gospel focus as his blood began to boil up in, what's in front of what's facing him in this culture and society. Luke tells us that Jesus turned to those disciples and rebuked them. And we don't know exactly what he said, but I think as we take a little bit deeper dive into this account, that we will come away with a pretty clear idea. But if we want to just boil all of this down to one big idea this morning that we can each take home with us, it would be this. The world needs Christians. The world needs Christians who are ready, who are resolved, and who are rejoicing at the privilege of carrying his love to them. The world needs Christians who are ready, resolved, and rejoicing at the privilege of carrying the love of Jesus Christ to them. That's what they need. 
That's what we need to be. That's who we need to be in this crazy moment in our country, in our history. And I believe that's who Jesus was training his disciples to be right in our text. If you look at Luke chapter 9, verse 51, here we find the very first lesson in how to engage our world around us with the love of Christ. And that is this, we must first be ready. We must be ready. Ready to accept God's plan and ready to see that we were born again for the mission. Luke writes in verse 51, when the days drew near for him to be taken up. Do you guys remember the 1978 movie Superman? Anybody recall that movie? Okay, one hand. All right. <laughs> we want to high five afterwards. You know, that was my favorite movie growing up when I was a kid, you know, Superman. I mean, what boy doesn't want to be Superman, right? That's awesome. Well, you know, the story starts out with the planet Krypton. It's about ready to explode. And there's one family that has figured it out, but they only have time to save their infant boy. And so they construct a spaceship and they send their infant boy careening into outer space right toward Earth where it crash lands somewhere in the middle of Kansas, maybe somewhere near here. And there was one family from their farm. They saw the, this meteor coming in and they go to the site, the Kents, and they find this infant boy emerging from the wreckage and they name him Clark and they take him into their home and they raise him as their own and never tell anybody else what happened. Well, Clark grows up always knowing that there's something a little different about him, but he can't quite figure out why until one day he discovers a glowing crystal in his barn, you recall? And so this crystal seems to be calling out to him. It's driving him to, to travel north, way north, far beyond any civilization. And when he gets there, he takes this crystal and he, if I was talking to a Gen Zer, I would say he yeets it, right? I mean, he, he throws it all the way out into the, the icy landscape where it rests on the surface of the snow and then sinks down and up from the snow due to the amazing Kryptonian technology emerges what? The Fortress of Solitude, right? And so he goes in the Fortress of Solitude and it's there that he begins to learn of his true identity and his purpose. And we could say that for Clark Kent, that was a pivotal moment in his life. A place from which he emerged no longer Clark Kent, but Kal-El or Superman. Great movie. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Luke records for us a pivot. A pivot in Jesus' life and ministry. But this pivot wasn't something Jesus discovered over time or, or through some life-changing event like a fortress of solitude. No, it was a pivot he had always planned on making because he was born ready. And I want you to see this morning with me that Jesus' coming was predetermined. He was born for the mission. Luke, under the inspiration of the Spirit, is cluing us into something really important here. In the language that he uses in verse 51, it signifies a pivot. The completion of one phase and the movement into another phase of his life and ministry. In the original language, the phrase, when the days drew near, literally could be translated to in the completing of or in the fulfilling of the days. So it's a phrase we don't just want to pass over. When something is said to be completed or to be fulfilled, what does that imply? It implies that there was a plan, that there, there's a predetermined outcome, there's a design to what's happening. And underlying Luke's historical gospel narrative is the reality that Jesus coming to this earth, his ministry, and his departure from this earth all were part of a predetermined plan, a plan made and enacted by God. From the visit we read in Luke's gospel, from the visit of Gabriel to Mary, to Zechariah's prophecy, on to the angel's announcement to the shepherds at the time of his birth, we understand that Luke is writing a narrative which demonstrates that the arrival on earth of Jesus was planned and purposed by God. Jesus wasn't just going through his earthly existence winging it. He wasn't figuring it out as he went along, like the rest of us. He wasn't just reacting to what was happening around him. He was deliberate. He was purposed. He was aimed at fulfilling a plan. This plan that was formed within the Trinity before time began. It was a mission that was first revealed in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where we see what we call the Proto-Evangelium, otherwise known as the first gospel. 
where Jesus, the offspring of the woman, you know the story in Genesis 3, the offspring of the woman would come and, to come and destroy the serpent, the devil. And it's really amazing to ponder, and we don't have time to look, look at it too deeply this morning, but to ponder how the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit decreed this plan before time began. If you want to take some notes, you can write down some verses like Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 11, or Acts chapter 2, verse 23, or Galatians chapter 4, 4 and 5, Ephesians 1, 1 through 10. I know I'm rattling these off, but... Take the time, read through some of those verses, Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 20, and you'll see that Jesus was always going to take this pivot to Jerusalem. It was always part of the plan. But that's the point, right? Jesus was ready. He was born ready because he was fulfilling a plan. And if we, as Christians, as his followers, are going to take the love of Christ into this dark and confused world, we need to accept the plan that God has for us, don't we? You and I were not born ready like Jesus was. He is the God-man. However, here this morning, we who have received Christ, who have believed in His name, according to John chapter 1, He gave the right to become children of God, not, by, not born of blood nor of the will of man or the flesh, but of God. We are born of God's will into God's plan, born, we could say, into his big story that he's writing. And we need to see that. We need to see that we were born again for the mission. That's what it means to be saved. You and I were saved. We were reborn, recreated for the plan, God's plan. Listen to chapter 2 in Ephesians, a very familiar passage, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It's God's doing. This is God's plan. He's the one that planned it before the foundation of the world. He goes on to say in that passage, it is the gift of God. What? Your salvation, our salvation, is the gift of God. It's not the result of work, so that no man may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared when? beforehand, that we should walk in them. We were born again for the mission. And so often we read Ephesians chapter 2 and we come away with the emphasis that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. And that is a right emphasis, by the way. That's a great emphasis. We come to God empty-handed, don't we? We come to Him spiritually dead, completely incapable of remedying our own lost condition. The only thing that you and I bring to our salvation is our sin. That's it. And he saves us purely out of his love with which he demonstrated, which was demonstrated through the reality that Christ died for our sins. We sung about that just a few moments ago. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 <clears throat> demonstrates this truth where Paul says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ by grace you've been saved. So amen, that is the focus of Ephesians chapter 2. But listen, if you want to be ready to be used by God, you have to accept his plan. You have to. You were born again for that plan, for that mission. The good works that God has prepared beforehand for you have everything to do with the mission. That's the reason why you and I are still here and not up in heaven. For Jesus, the days, Luke says, were fulfilled. Luke writes in verse 51, fulfilled for what? For him to be taken up. I believe that Luke is referring here to Christ's uh, ascension. Now, there are differing opinions about this. It's kind of fun to kind of tease out where people land on that particular phrase. The Greek word here means, means lifted up or to be taken up. So some think that Luke is referring to the cross. You recall Jesus speaking with the Pharisee Nicodemus in John chapter 3, don't you? The Pharisee comes to him by night, and Jesus is telling him the gospel. He basically is telling Nicodemus, look, look buddy, you are, you are dead and you're dumb. You know, you're supposed to be a teacher of Israel, and you don't get it. There's something happening here. There's something going down, and it's like this. The Son of Man must be lifted up. 
Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so some think that that is, that is what this is speaking of. That's a great foreshadowing. There's incredible, uh, incredible beauty into uh, digging into that particular interpretation. But I don't quite think that's what this context is pointing us to in Luke. Luke is actually giving us, I, I think, something more interesting. If you look at Luke chapter 9, verse 31... Here you find Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's there with Moses and Elijah who appeared with him in glory. And in, in verse 31, the scriptures tell us that Luke, Luke is, as he's writing, says that they spoke of what? What did they speak of G, about Jesus? They spoke of his departure. They spoke of his departure. He, with Moses and Elijah on that mount, spoke about what was about to, he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So when I see in verse 51... Luke writing that the time was fulfilled for him to be taken up. I think that he is, it's clear that he's speaking of Jesus being lifted up, taken up into the clouds, following his resurrection. That's what I believe it's saying. And you can read about that right at the end of Luke's gospel, by the way, where in chapter 24, verse 51, he says, while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. So this is all part of the pivot. It's Jesus completing his time on earth ready to finish the mission and to return to heaven. But that path for his return to glory took him on a straight line to the cross. And Luke continues, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, which brings us to our second point. First point is that we need to be ready. We need to be ready. We need to see that we were born again for the mission. But secondly, we need to be resolved. Resolved. We need to align our will. You need to align your will, and you need to seek God's help with that. Seek God's help with submission. There's an interesting dynamic going on here that we don't want to miss, because I think it just makes the resolve that Jesus shows to move toward what awaited him in Jerusalem here all the more precious. We've already established that Jesus' birth, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension to glory, and then ultimately his return from glory to earth are all part of God's big story, this eternal plan that was decreed by God among the divine council of the, of the Trinity. And there are some really deep theological things going on here. And for instance, in the Bible, we clearly see taught that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God. These three are the one uncreated Eternally existent God, all having this precisely the same nature and attributes and perfections and all who are equally worthy of all the worship and obedience of creation. That is the Trinity. In essence, they are three distinct persons united with ontological equality. We'll talk about that term in just a second. Equal in nature, equal in divine attributes. And yet we see revealed also within the Godhead, which is the theological term used to describe the th Trinity, we see something else. We see that there is a relational subordination. So ontological refers to God's being. It's who God is. Relational is referring to what God does, how God works, how God functions. So in the Bible, you will find that, there is, that the Father is always the one who is sending the Son. You'll never see any instance of the Son sending the Father. We'll see that the Holy Spirit is sent by Christ, and He comes, into the, comes from the Father to testify about the Son. Are we confused yet? Relational subordination. It's right there in Scriptures. But here's the point. Jesus knew the plan. He was there. He was there in eternity past, forming the plan among the Godhead. It kind of makes you go, Right? And yet Luke writes that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. So Jesus had perfect knowledge of what awaited him at Jerusalem. You and I know exactly what was about to happen, don't we? We read ahead. We know of the betrayal. We know of the suffering. We know of the agony and ultimately the horrible and infinite weight of our guilt and shame that he would bear in his body as he hung on the cross and the wrath of the Father would be poured out on him for us. We know all that, and he knew it too. He knew it vividly. And yet, as he's passing through Samaria, he had to overcome his own will through submission to the Father. He set his face, and he resolved to go there anyway. 
And this is where the other profound theological reality shows up. And I'm going to throw out another phrase you learn in Bible school. You ready? It's called the, the hypostatic union. Anybody hear of the hypostatic union before? Not too many hands going up. The hypostatic union refers to Jesus as the God-man. He is 100% God, and he's 100% man. John chapter 1, verse 14 tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? This eternal Word who was with God and was God in the beginning became flesh and dwelt among us. And He is the eternal Son of God who together with the Father and the Spirit decreed that this path of suffering would be necessary before Him in Jerusalem. And so He became fully human, fully human with two distinct natures, human and divine, fully human, fully divine, forever united in one person. That's a hypostatic union. And yet, as God, the, God was uniting his divine nature and his human nature into one person in the person of Jesus Christ, you don't see any mixture or dilution of either nature. That is the wonder of what we see in Scripture and in the person of Jesus Christ. And that means that if I can use the common language... As Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing what was waiting for him there, for Jesus, the struggle was real. The struggle was real. I think sometimes we, we, we forget that. This choice was not easy for him. The, though the cross was in one sense inevitable, right? It was always part of the plan. He decreed it. It was always part of the plan. Jesus still had to choose the cross to make it certain. You following with me? And he did so, overcoming his own aversion to it. Didn't he pray in the garden the night he was betrayed? My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. And then he said, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. This was, this was the hardest thing he ever had to do. And we shouldn't pretend that just because he is God that it was easy for him. The path to Jerusalem required total submission of his will to the Father's will. And with every single step he took in that direction, as he marched toward Jerusalem, that resolve, that resolve for him to continue aligning his will to the Father's will was tested and then renewed. Tested and then renewed. How did he do that? This is so rich and amazing. You have to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 50. Flip back to Isaiah chapter 50. This is like a sword drill. If you're using the ESV, it's on page 611. You have to see this. This is incredible. Here in Isaiah's prophecy, the voice of Messiah speaking, and we're going to start reading in verse 5. Listen to this. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. It's kind of hard to believe that this was written almost 800 years prior to the events of the crucifixion. Amazing. But he goes on. But, verse 7, the Lord God helps me. He helps me. Therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. I know that I shall not be put to shame. That's stunning. That's beautiful. How was Jesus able to overcome the horrors of what waited for him in Jerusalem? How did he do that? Well, he did it by submitting his will to the Father. And he was able to do that with the Father's help. That's why it says, the Lord God helps me. Doesn't this just give you a, a new appreciation for the sacrifice that he made for you? A new appreciation for why Jesus so often had to get alone and have time away in prayer with the Father so that he could align his will to the Father's will. Listen, this world, I know you will agree with me, this world is messed up, right? It's messed up. And there are so many things that make it hard to live with the kind of resolve that Jesus lived with. So many pressures that are being placed on believers today to stop living distinctly Christian lives for God. 
to stop speaking clearly, to stop living boldly. You know, 2020 should be the year in which we finally realize that the words of Jesus were true when he said, if the world hates you, listen, you know it hated me before it hated you. And you think it takes resolve to live for Christ in 2020? We all know that since Satan can't go after Christ directly today, who does he go after? You and me who are following him. Paul said it in Colossians chapter 1 that he was filling up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions. You and I can count on suffering for the name of Christ from here on out. Count on it. God promises it in 2 Timothy 3.12. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How can we keep it up day after day with our faces set like a flint, resolved? Because your resolve will be tested. I guarantee you that, Christian. Your resolve will be tested. And it will need to be renewed over and over and over again. Tested and renewed, just like every step Jesus took toward Jerusalem. Some of you in this room right now are paying a price for following Jesus Christ in today's canceled culture. I think it's reached all the way up to Marysville, hasn't it? I'm sure it has. You know, we have godly police officers, officers in our church back in Kansas City. People who see, they see things, and they put up with things that most of us will, would never have to put up with or see. We can't even imagine. How can they find the strength? How can they to keep aligning their will to the Father's will day after day, to the Father's plan? Many others of you are being tested in your jobs with your friends, even rejected by your families. Where will you find strength to keep putting one step in front of the other in your march toward your Jerusalem, knowing what awaits for you there? Listen, the answer for you and for me is the same as it was for Jesus. You can align your will by seeking God's help with submission. Part of the help that God also gives us is sitting right next to you, right here in this room. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25 says it, doesn't it? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. In other words, in other words to stay on mission. We stir up one another so we can stay on the mission because we were born ready for that. We were born again for that. Not neglecting, the author of Hebrews goes on, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day drawing near. That is why the church meets together. When the day, that day comes, what a glorious day that will be. But like our God, we too must pass through tribulation before we enter the kingdom of God. And if we're trusting God, if we're seeking His help with submission, we won't be, as Hebrews says, of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we will be of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So be resolved. Align your will. Seek God's help with submission. Finally, we come to our last lesson as Jesus rebukes the disciples for wanting to call down fire from heaven. This is where I told you I saw myself. I was frustrated. I've been frustrated. I still am frustrated with what I'm seeing. In our culture, I'm, uh, all the things that I'm observing around our country. People calling evil good and good evil. A country filled with what we see described in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. Listen to this description. Tell me if it doesn't ring true. People living in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to the hardness of their heart, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. We live in a world that is rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ today. The Samaritans in that village rejected the Lord Jesus too. So why then, why then did Jesus rebuke, turn and rebuke those disciples? Those disciples who maybe were even rightly angered, rightly incensed by the refusal of these Samaritans of their Lord. I believe it was because they were short-sighted. 
even though Jesus had already told them why he had come. In fact, in Luke chapter 15, he would tell them again with parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, why he had come. He had come not to serve, but to serve, right? And to give his life as a ransom for many. But they didn't see that clearly yet. They were looking for something different. What were the disciples still looking for? They were looking for a mighty Messiah who would, who would restore the honor of Israel by overthrowing their oppressors. We talk a lot critical race theory. It was, that, it was back there too. They wanted to overthrow their oppressors. That's what they were looking for. But Jesus was aiming much, much, much higher. He was not there to bring fire from heaven. He was there to bring help from heaven. He was not coming as a mighty conqueror, but he had come to be a merciful Messiah. He didn't come to be a social justice warrior. He wasn't interested in revolution. He wasn't interested in disruption or systemic overthrow. He was interested in something much greater. And as he set his face toward Jerusalem, he was looking through the cross all the way to the crown. The crown he would wear in a kingdom that would come. A kingdom not of this world, but one that is filled with every redeemed soul purchased for God by the blood uh, that he would spill at Calvary. A kingdom of people like us in this room. People like those out there in the world today from every tribe and language and people and nation. All of whom deserve to be canceled. All who deserve to be written off just like every single one of us in this room. But instead, he is gloriously and he is graciously and he's mercifully and he's powerfully bringing those people together purchasing them with his own blood so that they would become worshipers of this lamb who was slain. Jesus wasn't interested in retribution. He was interested in rejoicing. And so he aimed high and he showed compassion with that heavenly vision always before him. A joy that was set before him, which enabled him to endure that cross, to despise its shame, and then to be seated at the right hand of the throne of God in the victor's seat where he belongs, where he sits right now today, even as we are nine days out from a crazy election. We carry the love of Christ to this world rejoicing. We aim high. We show God's compassion with that heavenly vision in our minds. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I just want you to picture right now that person in your life, or that group, or that political leader that gets your blood boiling. Can you do that with me? And I just want you to consider the power of the gospel. I want you to consider the reach of God's love. Just take a moment and reflect how he brought the gospel into your life. What circumstances did God use? Who were the people that he used to carry Christ's love to you? How did God intervene in your life? And let that reflection begin to firm up your resolve to think more heavenly today. To think about the earthly things which even frustrate you or even anger you, but to keep that, res that resolve intact. Listen, we can stand for truth, we can stand for righteousness, but we can do so without calling down fire from heaven. God sent help. He sent help for this world. He sent a Savior. So instead, let's pray to God to intervene, even in the life of just one person, because there's great joy in heaven over the one sinner that repents. Does Jesus need to rebuke us this morning for losing sight of this, for losing sight of that plan, losing sight of the mission? Are you ready to accept that today, accept the plan, to see that carrying his love to these lost ones is the mission you were born again for? It doesn't matter what sign is in somebody's yard. They need the Lord, and he sent help. Are you prepared this morning to align your will to his, to resolve, to seek his help in overcoming your will, to move toward your Jerusalem, no matter the personal cost? 
Or have you been short-sighted? Like I was earlier this year, looking to win the argument, looking to defeat the opponent, declaring victory for your cause. Church, we, we need to aim higher than that. We need to put our feet where the heart of Jesus is and dream of the worship that he will receive around that heavenly throne. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. And as we've seen how your son did not turn backward from his mission, but instead he pursued it in submission to you, we're overwhelmed that he went to Jerusalem in order to make the, to make the crucifixion certain. He willed to die. He laid down his own life and he willed to die because he loved us. So God, I pray that you would make us ready. You would make us willing to hope for the individuals that we know all around us that they might also find life in that Savior. I pray you'd help each of us this morning in this body to fulfill the purpose for which you saved us and to gather more worshipers for our King. We pray this in his holy name. Amen.